Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 104, recorded on 8 August 2012. That's a Wednesday, if you couldn't work that out yourself. In the show today, DRM sucks, but is Steam for Linux a bad thing? Telcom takes pain, but LTE is coming to South Africa sooner than we might think. And the Internet Archive is now using BitTorrent. Thanks for watching. Today's random. In electricity, a corona discharge is an electrical discharge brought on by the ionization of a fluid surrounding a conductor that is electrically energized. The discharge will occur when the strength potential gradient of the electric field around the conductor is high enough to form a conductive region, but not high enough to cause electrical breakdown or arcing to nearby objects. It is often seen as a bluish or other color glow in the air adjacent to the pointed metal conductors carrying high voltages. Spontaneous corona discharges are undesirable where they waste power in high voltage systems or where the high chemical activity in a corona discharge creates objectionable or hazardous compounds such as ozone. Controlled corona discharges are used in a variety of filtration, printing, and other processes. How is this actually wonderful? All right, so uh, 104 in Roman numerals, you'll notice a trend when I come up with randoms, is CIV. <laughs> and so um, I Googled CIV and uh, came up to uh, uh, the, the unit um, that the, uh, the corona inception voltage oh, okay, can be cool. found with Peak's Law. Uh, and uh, so I came upon Corona, coronal Very cool. discharge. Yeah, indeed. Fantastic. So some of the uh, some of the um, uses of uh, coronal discharge applications: uh, drag reduction over a flat surface. It's uh, removal of unwanted electric charges on in aircraft to prevent damage to avionics. Um, so uh, manufacturing of ozone, obviously sanitation of pool water, scrubbing particles from air and air, uh, air in air conditioning systems. Sorry. So I thought that so it's like Very cool. fairly fairly useful. useful. Uh, Fairly useful thing that uh, at, at least I don't think of when I think of photocopying or air ionization. So, uh, well, that makes sure because I know with the photocopying, it's all ionizing so that it transfers and then it goes over the next phase, which basically picks up the ink mm -hmm. and then. Yeah, so now, cool. now, now we know now now that uh, there will be a Wikipedia link in the show notes, you'll be able to go and read about the Corona discharge. And <coughs> learn about how these things happen. So you're just laughing about the RSC comments, which I cannot mention because they're not quite PG. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't fall in with our PG-13 yes. uh, policy. All right. So some events coming up. Um, we've got Ubuntu Hour this Saturday. That's correct. Cool. cool. All right. At the Rosebank Mug and Bean. Yes. What does There's a train mean? going there, isn't there? Uh, there is the Gau train. The Gau train. That's correct. Um, yes. All right. Um, so no, what, the Gau train, the station is right outside the Mall of Rosebank, so you just kind of mission through the Mall of Rosebank, get to Mug and Bean, and there will be a bunch of geeks, some of them with laptops, some of them with some CDs too, so if you don't have Ubuntu and you don't have a decent internet connection, they'll have CDs to hand so out to like you. So it's like there's going to be a bit of an install party going on as well. Yeah, well, while we're at it, why okay. not? So uh, you seem to be knowing, what, you seem to know what's going on with uh, Ubuntu Hour. What's Ubuntu Hour? Exactly that. hour of installing and talking In, in this it. case, it's actually Ubuntu. two two hours because um, okay. it's from 12 to 2. So we'll be sitting at Mug well, and Bean drinking cool coffee. Junk, I think it's just honesty hour. Like the first hour is honesty. We are going to talk junk for an hour and then we'll get to business. Yes. Sure. Of like course. Drink yeah. lots of coffee. And drink lots of coffee and have some of those massive breads. I mean muffins that uh, Mug and Bean sells. Cool. We yeah. already have a debate on this in uh, IRC with uh, mint aficionados going Ubuntu was so last year. <laughs> <laughs> really? We're getting hipster about Linux now, guys? Come on. <laughs> I love it. Um, added to this, I just want to also add while we're talking about the Software Freedom Day, we we busy planning it. Cool. Uh, I think it's 13th of September is the date, the Saturday. I think it's 13th of September. I'll give more feedback. Um, Some of the people didn't pitch for the, uh, for the, uh, the organization meeting because they were sick as dogs. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, don't <laughs> worry. We, we had quite a nice turnout, so we've got cool. that. We're just now looking at several locations, and once we have locations, we'll start letting people know what's happening. Cool. Sounds good. Which should be good. Yeah. Then, uh, this is a first, and great news for me, uh, except that it's very far away, the South African Discworld Convention. Um, for those who don't know what Discworld is, this is Terry Pratchett's world of yeah. madness that rides on the back of a turtle. Um, um, and if you don't know who the Terry Pratchett Atun, is... The Great so it's the Discworld sitting on what the back of four elephants, which sit sits in the back of the great attune. Sorry, I've read all the books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so Terry Pratchett, well worth reading. Very well worth reading. Mm -hmm. um, but possibly don't start with the first ones. 
Start a bit later in and then work your way back. I really enjoyed the Mort. The, the, uh, the Mort's Mort very books. good. Uh, we Free Men is awesome. I would start with We Free Men. Just realize... Uh, and I like the God's it. God series as well. Um, those three books with, with carrot in it. Of course, which is not quite a difficult one. You should try Good Omens. Yes, I really enjoyed Good Omens. You'll uh, notice I'm keeping quiet in the corner here because I don't like Terry Pratchett. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, some... People in Cape Town are trying to get together and get a convention going in 2014. We need more geek cons in this country. So if you can make this thing stick, that'd be great. Um, though they've got some events that are run-up events and getting pre preparation for it. Uh, I've pasted it in RC and it'll also be on our wiki. So go check it out. Mm. Go get involved in Cape Town and maybe it'll make its way up here mm. eventually. And, and we all know like international foreigner people thingies like traveling to Cape Town. So if we can get the cons going... Um, and show them that there's a significant fan, you know, fan base. Then maybe we can get, you know, some international people. Katie Sackoff, you know, Nathan Fillion at these cons. That'd very be, cool. That'd very be great. Cool. Um, Rage is coming up. Um, for those of you, we did warn you. Uh, tickets went on sale last weekend for the LAN. They are sold out. They sold out in a few hours. Of course uh, they did. And we warned you about it. Um, but just a quick update: they have sold out. We're not going to tell you about Rage again until the end of September. Um, it is happening at the start of October. It's, it's always great. Um, even though in recent years, it has turned into a bit of a, you know, the, the actual showroom floor has turned into a bit of a marketplace. Uh, people coming to sell off all their, all their stock. And that actually happens. You check all these computer retailers, they buy a stand, they come and sell all their stock and they're sold out for two weeks afterwards while they replenish. No, it's still quite good. The, uh, my recommendation would be, if you're going to be there, try and be there really early on Saturday um, because then you can actually get around and, and speak to people and see the stuff. Because, mm -hmm. you know, an hour, even an hour in, it, it goes crazy. It goes it's just berserk. so busy. And Sunday, there's, uh, Sunday, it does wind down a little, but even early on Sunday is a good time to yeah. be there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we should have to be recording again this year. I know people are, co co are going to be contacting to organize press passes again. Cool. Sounds good. And then for uh, all your geek needs, um, uh, your, your, your geek event needs, I should say, stardates.co.za. Um, it looks like we've got stuff in there like movie releases, all kinds of good stuff. So Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah I've got you good. Um, also then, one of our people who's been at RC quite a bit, uh, he's, I think he's Sunny tonight. Uh, I've just gone blank on his real name. He's normally Lacquer Weather UK. Sorry, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll get you your, your name. I think it's Philip... You get so used to seeing the RC names that you, you don't even think about it. Uh, I, I don't even think of Luke as Luke. He's fried roadkill. Yeah. Mm. True story. I've actually done that before. Um, I'm looking for him on G-Talk. And I can't remember his name, but I can remember his nick. And I type <laughs> I, in fried roadkill and there he is. I, I can truly understand that. Um, he did a intro for us, which hopefully the m current mix is going to be able to play quickly. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, yeah. Actually, it's it's pretty cool. Let's see if that works. I, yeah, that, not that, that did not work. There we go. <laughs> Sonny says he's not telling us his name. Um, but anyway, I know he Oops. lives I, I in... I kind of chopped it off a little bit there. Oh, okay. we, we well, don't we, see we what's going it. out to the, uh, the uh, stream. Uh, uh, so. the, the current mix, unfortunately, is not as good as the... Yes, the I'm sorry, mixer. guys. I'm rusty. <laughs> <laughs> um, All this multimedia. But the person, they've got a website, www.sunrise3d.co.uk. Um, thank you very much, Sonny, for doing that. Um, I know he lives in England. Um, he's also the guys, there's some photos, I actually worked, uh, the photo didn't go to Facebook, but I put on Facebook now as well. Uh, he's the guys that had us playing on a projector, or our big, big faces. <laughs> cool. But cool. Yep, so um, if you have just tuned in, you can join us in IRC now at irc.ltnet.tv. Well done, Tim. Yes. So you can actually access the mobile client directly at that, at that URL. Um, you can also just use an IRC client, point it at that URL, port 6667, hash LTNet, the channel. Um, and uh, you can contact us via email, anything you want, at letstalknetwork.tv. And, and uh, I, talking about that, I must apologize. I suddenly realized that Google spam had suddenly gone a bit crazy on me. And I found a whole bunch of emails people had sent me. Um, I've now actively looking and done a whole bunch of workarounds to, to make sure that it doesn't occur. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, yeah, Google spam filter has has got more aggressive uh, yeah. recently, I've noticed. It's um, got more aggressive and it's got more lax in other instances. Like I've found things that are clearly spam in my inbox. Mm -hmm. My mm. problem is I'm using three what? different um, Google Apps accounts that are all feeding in to each other. Okay. And it was in that feeding in stuff. I thought I'd said it. They changed the way they filter and forward emails. 
Okay. Um, before, if you had a filter, uh, there was a filter I'd written that just basically sent all email to my one account. It stopped working. Now, the problem is I didn't know it had stopped working because I'm not logging to other accounts. So that, that's where this stuff. So if you sent me emails and I haven't replied, it most probably is not me being rude. It's just literally I haven't got it. Um, so please just resend it. Cool. Um, okay. Then we've got a wiki. If you haven't checked that out yet, you can check that out. What's the URL? wiki.ltnet.tv wiki.letstalknetwork.tv wiki cool and you can follow us on Twitter at Let's Talk Geek follow us on G Plus Let's Talk Network and Circle uh, we've got a YouTube channel which a lot of you should be familiar with already yeah. um, I always forget what that is L is it LTNet LT Star I always forget what Let's Talk Network, Let's Talk Network. It's, yeah. it Let's it's Talk actually Network? LT Star yeah. Net. Net unfortunately YouTube one and you can't change your name once you've done it yeah yeah so it is what it is we're also uh, on Facebook yes and yes. we have a bot in IRC so Play with the bot, search for Jenny, um, and it gives you all the commands that you can give it. Uh, I know you can get it to give you XKCD and Google searches. and Yeah, we already Google have searches. that. So you can t type dot .xkcd, and, uh, and she gives you a valid XKCD link. Cool. I quickly want to try this, uh, uh, the, the animation again, and this time you guys can look along. Woo! It's playing without sound, though, so... Uh, cool. Yeah, we, we, we're going to put it um, pro properly it into the video... Like. Um, when I edit this for YouTube. Fantastic. Sounds good. All right, into the topics for the week. Uh, first, Fight. Yeah, first thing that's, that was quite cool uh, for uh, Linux geeks is that uh, Valve claims that its optimizations on for OpenGL, Left 4 Dead 2, makes it perform better on Linux than it does on Windows. Mm -hmm. My first question, obviously, is what hardware? Because, like, how did they get 3D I, graphics I, to even work? I believe they were using fairly insane hardware. Um, I can't remember uh, how you insane. You get three D graphics generally to work. Uh, I, I just can't get it working on Radeon cards. I never have. I, I've got it working on Radeon. I find Radeon and and Harrod will disagree with me. I generally find Nvidia works a lot better than Radeon. Depends on what you what, what you're busy doing. I think for three D gaming, um, Nvidia will probably work better than the eight than the AMDs. But for multi monitor support, the AMDs are just downright terrible. Um, yes. And, and yeah, the Which ATIs I can get. Okay, no, but the multi monitor support on Ubuntu has been fairly shocking. Well, an X in general yep. has yeah. just been fairly Look, shocking. Generally, oh. I find what you actually do is you want to make sure you're wow. using the cards tools to do the multi monitor. Okay. Don't, don't use. We said it was a beast. Intel Core i7, 3930K, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 680, 32 gigs of RAM. 30, that's cheap. 32 on gigs the of RAM card is cheap. or on the PC? Oh, no, that, that's in the PC. Yeah. It Comparatively, makes, I've, I've put 16 gigs in my PC yeah, at home, okay. and I realize two. Windows gets up to eight. 32 gigs around that's what that's four eight gig sticks, that's yes. not even expensive. Not expensive, sure. Yeah, it's just but a, I mean, sure. I've I, I don't think I've really used the system above eight. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was fairly cool. And good news for OpenGL, they uh, were yeah. comparing uh, also, um, valid point, they were comparing Windows 7 Service Pack 164 bit to Ubuntu 1204 32 bit. Uh, for some other compatibility. Okay, yeah. 32 bit is okay. So that also suggests to me, by the way, run 32 bit Ubuntu. Uh, I've been doing that and it's been a lot faster. Yeah, and you have less issues. Uh, mm. For those of you who were around when I first started at Let's Talk Geek, one of the things, the first geeky things I brought to the show was my build of Adobe Air for 64 bit uh, Ubuntu because yeah. um, it wasn't supplied. And yeah. we all want a tweet deck to work. Yes. And so you Look, had to just hack at the, the having said package that If you're doing any server stuff, you want 64-bit. Yeah. Okay. It if you're compiling sense. Android, I think you also need 64-bit. Um, let's any MySQL Postgres, you, you want that 64-bit because it should give you quite a nice speed increase. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, think about it. You can fit more. It can actually use the full register. Uh, so like as long as it's optimized for 64-bit. Yes. Nice. Yeah. All right. Interesting. And as time goes by, they, uh, so I'm running 64, but... Yeah. While we're on the topic of Valve, um, for those of you who don't know, Valve operates a, uh, a game retail platform called Steam. That's very convenient and uh, also simultaneously uh, very, very bad for those of us uh, with credit cards linked to it because you just click and you buy games and your money disappears. But uh, bye bye money. GNU founder Richard Stallman has called DRM Steam gear for Linux games unethical. Gareth, uh, you popped this in there. So uh, what, what's your take on this? You, you read the article. Um, I, I, I get his point. Um, he's on the uh, extreme side of freedom as in open source and as in you can do with the software what you like. Yeah, so free, he's, he's the Not head of the Free Software Foundation, yes. for those who don't and know. So, but, but extreme and with, go way overboard. Yes, but with, with his stance, he takes the extreme side yeah, of yeah. that 
total, yeah, he's total ab- freedom. He's absolutist exactly. when it comes to freedom of so software. I get where he's coming from. I get his point. Also, the Free Software Foundation runs a campaign called Defective by Design. Mm. And Defective by Design is wholly against DRM and games. Any form of DRM. Sure. So for those who so so for those who've never used Steam, the way Steam's DRM works is it phones home to Valve, mm-hmm. and um, if you're logged into Steam and you're online, it's it phones home to Valve before it launches the game, and um, it has this offline. It, like every time I bring this up, people are like, "Oh, but Steam has an offline mode." Steam's offline mode is crap. It's, yeah, I've never got it working. I've got it working once. Yeah, I remember in the good old Half Life two days when we were still on dial-up internet at home. Um, I managed to get offline mode working, but you still had to log in every 10 days. Okay. My, to- my, my big thing here is th- 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 there's two discussions here. One okay. is DRM is evil and stupid, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Second one is suddenly now when you're putting Steam on Linux, no, that, because it's Linux, it's, it's evil to do it. You know, those are two separate arguments. Okay. My thing is Steam is bringing their games to Linux. Yes. yes. Why is DRM any worse than Linux? than it is on Windows or Mac. Yeah, it isn't. But that's not. I th- that wasn't exactly his point, but no, was it? Stormont says, Dear I'm Steam for Linux games. Is, uh, is yeah, but, but that might just be the, like headlining. So I think he just reiterated the point I, I of don't, defective by design. Yeah, may, maybe he didn't need to mention Steam. DRM games for Linux uh, is unethical. But, again, but for any platform. It's, it's, defective it be, by design yes, is any platform. Be. DRM is unethical. Yeah, but and, and for no, the headline, the headline needed to resonate with, uh, as a journalist, I know this happens. Yes. The headline needed to resonate with the news of the time, which is the fact that Steam is coming to Linux. So they obviously asked Stallman specifically about Steam for Linux. But Stallman is of the opinion that DRM is uh, evil. Yes. Uh, look, that I'm not going to disagree with you. I, I dislike DRM. Unethical. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it basically adds very little. It gets worked around. And it says, generally, if you want to play your games um, you know, freely and anywhere you want and actually get the full thing out of it, go pirate it. Mm-hmm. And as, I, I as can't say I've ever had a good experience with DRM as a, a customer. Even Steam. And, and the thing that grates my cheese is I'm that... I'm not saying I'm advocate buy it, then pirate it. So you've paid for the game and then you get all the freedom. <laughs> even Yes, even with Steam. But the one thing that Steam gives me is I can go in there and click and my money's gone. And yes. I have the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And, and Steam also pretty much circumvents any sort of uh, regional blocks we've got in South Africa due to the, um, there the, are the software ratings board. Or there, the, there are still games that are regional The former publications game. board. There are still games. Every now and again, you find a game that, sorry, you can't access. Yeah, this but game that is entirely up to the publisher. Yes. So what, what I think Steam does is they you know, just let people... Be, because I think the tricky thing, um, to compare this with what's happening on iOS, I think Apple makes it quite difficult for people to publish games to South Africa based on my discussions with developers. With Steam, they make it quite easy for developers to publish games to South Africa and uh, regional laws be damned. Um, so if a game is blocked in South Africa you know, with, uh, on Steam, it's the publisher's choice. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's happened very rarely for me. It's maybe, you know, in that time yeah. while the, the local agreement is being set up with the local distributor, mm. these are probably AAA titles that you see this with. Mm. Yeah, not, not uh, like I said, it's not often. It's once or twice. It's either yeah, indies or AAAs. Really? You see this in indies? I've never seen it with an indie game on Steam. Yeah. Look, I've, I, I've I have seen sometimes actually. even with app stores like Android where some indie developer for some weird reason says, I only want this to work in America. Yeah. And, and you do get that occasionally. Yeah. Anyway, back to the point. Yes. Um, yeah, so Stallman is on that side of the argument. I'm on the side of it's no one's forcing you to use Steam. No one's forcing you to buy Steam games. It's giving people a bigger choice with games, and it's bringing a really great um, engine. I mean, it's bringing uh, the, the, the Valve, source the engine. source engine, to Linux, which is pretty damn cool, and they've got it running with Left 4 Dead 2 pretty and solidly as well. That's you know, why I say I want to separate the argument about it being Linux. You know, mm. the fact that Steam is putting the F and the time in to bring games to Linux is awesome. I'm, I, you know, I want to... Applaud them for that, and finally, and it means, that, and you're going to see, you know, now my game can actually must be work faster because I don't have all this other, I don't want to use that word, <laughs> junk. running junk. So I think of another <laughs> rubbish, <laughs> rubbish <laughs> running on it as well in the background that just eats resources. Mm, mm. Uh, now it says it will be optimized. Well, that's one thing about Steam stuff. I mean, it, it eats marginal resources. I'd say it gives you a cool in-game overlay. Uh, it tracks playtime. Um, so I'm not talking about the Steam stuff. I'm talking about in when I'm running Windows, the search thing that kicks in the background, the other 20 million apps that, that all want to be running and using 
stuff all the time. We in Linux, if if I see my hard drive slow or something slow, I, I can get in and kill it in about two seconds, and I know, which actually makes the guys be more aware that the, if they if they do make this stuff behave badly, the guys are just going to remove it. Mm -hmm. uh, when Windows, I just don't see that. Fair enough. Now, while we're on the topic of DRM, uh, Ubisoft's Uplay DRM installs a rootkit, leaving PCs vulnerable to attack. And this is not the first time that a rootkit has been accused of this. And uh, apparently, Firefox blocks this uh, plugin by default. Cool. So, uh, Gareth, I think you popped this into the... That, that about sums well. it up. All right. Um, yeah, Uplay installs, uh, and, and I think it may have been a, uh, maybe a Google engineer on holiday or something like that, um, who found this. Um, it installs uh, a web app or, or a way for you to launch games from your browser. Um, and through that, you can actually have it launch anything from through, through that. Exactly. So in, so in remote, the, the so demo basically exploit, remote code execution. Yes. So in the demo exploit, they uh, just launched a calculator. But you can get it to launch pretty much anything. Pretty much any EXE on the system. And well, you still have to get your malicious EXE on the system. But the fact is you can... You can get or, it there. Or you mean you, you run like Chrome in the background, can, command line to download your DRM EXE <laughs> and then run point, it. Point, 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 point. Um, all right, so... Um, pretty bad. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. And um, while we're on it, Uplay, that's the DRM in use uh, by Assassin's Creed and and those games. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it? Mm -hmm. Silent, Silent Hunter or something was one of the games. Silent Hill? Um, no, no, no. Um, oh. All right, so now what's... <laughs> Wrong publisher. What's interesting... Uh, uh, Tom Clancy as well, Ghost Recon Future Soldier. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this DRM, comparing it to Steam. Now, Steam has a phone home thing, which irritates me already. Well, it has a phone home thing once. Well, no, every time you launch the game. Okay, yes. Okay. Now, what <laughs> Uplay does start. is it needs to be connected to the internet at all times. Mm -hmm. If you ever lose your connection to the internet while playing the game, the game crashes eventually. And it actually streams content from the web, which if any, if any of you have played an MMO, you realize that this is basically the only way to have effective DRM. Because any other DRM can be circumvented unless mm. you're pulling content from the internet. So basically, unless you ship an incomplete game, there's no real way to protect your game. No. That's the bottom line. And so well, you play has uh, gone to that extreme of DRM. Pirates going to pirate. And you, you, that's why no. I no longer buy Ubisoft games. As much as I love Assassin's Creed, as much as I love Prince of Persia, until they take the stuff out of the games, I'm not buying it. Yes. That's the bottom line. Not Agreed. playing it even. Yes. And I always wonder how much do they actually lose to it. Yeah, they probably lose nothing. And plus, I think a lot of most uh, people that are concerned about these things, like I am, they probably buy on console anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and console, like, it's got its whole own uh, mechanism for, for Talk software, about for which, uh, software protection. Talking about which I had in the protection. link, but I'm looking at PS2. They've got a fully working emulator. Oh, interesting. Uh, for PC, I assume. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's very cool. Well, I was bound to have it. I know that with PS1. Because I know recently they've... they've I know one of the guys who's quite involved had said that they've cracked the loss of the, the security codes. Mm -mm. All right. <coughs> um, so that brings us to some of the bigger news happening in South Africa at the moment is that Telcom has actually got fined by the, um, the competition tribunal. Yes, finally. Yes, all right. So what, only what, five, five years in the making? Uh, 2004. It's been Seven, eight years. Eight. eight years in the making. So um, they got fined 449 million bucks. Uh, that's Rand, uh, as in Viltain dollar. Yeah. Um, and uh, which is a pretty significant amount, but it's also fairly small if you consider the penalty that was being asked, asked for, which I think was like three and a half billion or four two billion. billion. Oh, two billion. Two billion. I always billion. lose it, track it's, of how many billion. It's exactly. a lot less than what those, than what they asked for, and it's a lot less than what, or a lot more than what Telcom well, said they should do. Telcom yeah. said 20 million. Yes, yes. So it's, it's sort of in between, but skewed more towards the other side. Um, it, uh, the, the way these penalties are calculated, I think what, what was being asked for was 10% of Telcom's revenue during um, that period, during at, at 2004, so the 2004 and for the listeners, ask for why are they getting fined? Oh, okay, so uh, the competition tribunal has ruled that Telcom abused its monopoly position in the period 1999 to 2004, preventing Vans, uh, those I think value-added network service providers, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, from getting customers effectively. So Telcom uh, offered, you know. From from my understanding of it, Telcom offered exactly what these guys were offering, but at a lower price. 
Um, and they made it impossible for these guys to, to offer the, the same services profitably at that same price. Yes. Because these guys had to buy what is known as essential facilities, well, well, essential well, services from telecom to deliver said services. Never mind. I think without profit, they made it impossible for the guys to provide this service. Right. No, the I, same price. I wouldn't know. But it's, it, it was pretty bad. Now, this whole situation raises a, a bunch of questions. Because the fact is, telecom, um, if you haven't kept track of it, telecom's in a bad state right now. Um, Telcom has missed out on its deal with KT Corp. Yeah. Uh, Telcom share price is in the toilet. There is talk of nationalizing Telcom. Again. Um, yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories around the lower share price and government doing some kind of aggressive takeover. Um, what do they call it? A hostile takeover. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and the fact is, is that if this happened in the time of Telcom's dominance, then maybe... You know, we'd, we'd, it, we'd be in a completely different telecommunications landscape today. But as things stand at the moment, um, the wheel has turned. And uh, Telcom, Telcom is worse off for it. The end users are worse off for it. And like yeah, just the country the, is worse off for the it. The reason why it's taken so long is Telcom's fault. Uh, not necessarily. The, 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 the competition tribunal has, has um, found fault with ICASA and the DOC during this process for ineffective regulation for pretty much giving Telcom free reign mm, to do this. Mm. Uh, one mustn't forget the government handed Telcom its monopoly yeah, um, yeah. and handed Telcom the ammunition with which to delay this whole thing. So, um, so 2004 happened. Telcom then, um, uh, from reading the articles uh, uh, about this on the web, Telcom basically then fought and said the Competition Commission, the Competition Tribunal, does not have jurisdiction here. Yeah. This eventually went to, the, I think, the Supreme Court of Appeal. It went to a Court of Appeal, is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And that eventually, um, it got found, I think, in 2009 or the thereabouts, yep. that, uh, in fact, sorry, Telcom, this is under their jurisdiction. So it took five years to get to the point where now jurisdiction is established. And then the, the hearings but, but, began. But that's what I mean. Is Telcom fought this as hard and for as long as but they could. you would expect them to. But the problem is, the, the, the argument is that they wouldn't have been able to. If the correct. So, so to lay the blame at one party's feet isn't entirely fair. Um, yes, Telcom fought it. And I, I guess they're bearing the brunt of that now. But the fact is that the, the, the whole telecommunications situation in South Africa and the fact that not only not I mean government was a majority shareholder is yeah. a majority shareholder their vested interest in telecom was part of the problem um, how do you objectively regulate something a, a, where you know you, an incumbent yes when you are dependent on their profits it's yeah. it's a very very sad situation um, and uh, yeah and, and it's it's really hobbled us um, I, I think that if there were if you know good competition to telcom imagine if they were since 2004 till now it would have been there were co there was competition Look, for telcom in south africa i still <laughs> think at that point in time they should have split telcom up that that's what a lot if of people are saying may, may, made it its own competition um, so you have you have like a, a wholesale and retail division i yes. think was the basic argument so and uh, and uh, and basically the bt model so you also have you have a company that manages the local loop, yes. which is the real point of contention. Um, it's the, the essential infrastructure that nobody else could deploy in a reasonable time um, to compete. Yes. Um, and that was uh, largely built at the time with taxpayer money. Mm. In that time, now Telcom also argues, because this thing has dragged on for so long, Telcom has replaced a lot of that infrastructure with its own money. Um, so that's what they're arguing now, well, part of the argument now against local loop unbundling. All right, let, let's follow that argument. It's proven they were anti-competitive. Anti yes. Right. So they were given a monopoly by the government. Yes. Anti-competitive, which means they've heard and they abused that monopoly higher position. profits, which they've used to buy equipment and upgrade. Well, them. that's what you would think. But uh, if you go and look at it, um, and this is, and they, they are, they are, there is a debate here. But I would argue that Telcom did not invest enough in its network. And if you look at the history, Telcom paid special dividends. They, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous what was done with this money. Um, and, uh, and didn't n invest nearly enough into its network infrastructure. Uh, the MSAN project, which we so sorely need now, mm, which mm. Um, uh, is, is going to offer South Africans, um, you know, th that end up in the region of one of these nodes, 40 megabit per second connections. And I'll smile from year to year the day that happens. That should have happened five years ago. True. Um, 
And I don't know if that was technically feasible. Um, so someone who's more tech savvy will have to just inform me there because Telcom has said that the, this rollout is dependent on a specific piece of equipment which uh, lets them uh, sort of talk to their legacy stuff. Um, but I, I mean, I think that Ideally, we should have been looking at improving well, our speeds well, uh, and, and fixed line from that, in this country five years ago. By they've been putting stuff spending on the money, network. you wouldn't need the legacy stuff. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Uh, so all, all in all, I mean, it, it is very doomy and gloomy at the moment. Uh, I just want it to be sorted out. I want the government to step in. I'm not sure how. Look, yeah, I must be honest. I don't know what. I would actually argue government now needs to step out. That yeah. the, the government has demonstrated that they are not capable of running telecommunications companies in this country. Centec, my wireless, Sorry, was a dismal failure. When I say step in, I don't mean step in to own telecom. So maybe d divest and work now purely from the legislative, uh, fix a car, so fix all these things. Direct industry. Yes. Um, and industry has already expressed to government interest in uh, the government's developmental goals, for example, of rural broadband rollouts. Industry have already, uh, and if the wireless industry, the cellular guys, have already expressed interest in government um, managing a, the rollout of a kind of open access network that all these guys then would buy capacity yeah. on mm. to deliver services to rural areas. They all obviously want to own their own networks in urban areas where it's profitable to do yes. so. Yeah. But for rural areas where it's not profitable to roll out towers, open access network, administer, you know, uh, however that works, but you know, basically a bunch of people chip in on, on rolling out this network, maybe with some government funding and government incentives to roll out there. Um, and then, uh, just like as the Seacom cable, you buy capacity on this infrastructure. Um, so industry is willing to, at least it, on the surface, to work with government in this. Um, and so, uh, so it's uh, it, yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a very uh, I'd like if they just get out. In other words, uh, forget about the infracos, forget about telcom, um, sell <coughs> your shares in that, just and focus on governing. On yes. putting on regulating where people still have a dominant market position. Stop, stop competition yeah, and and anti competitive yeah, things. Yeah. Fix all those things and and uh, foster competition in the space. That's government's role, not actually running a telecommunications company. Talk about infocracy. They made another loss this year. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we need to my, move on. My point is Moving made. along. Yes. <laughs> All right. So while we're on the topic of monopolies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Tim, you put this in. Scare yeah. tactics or super sport, sport really? <laughs> this whole thing about super sport coming out about going, you know, it's illegal if you VPN and you stream the... Olympic Games from another country um, and, you know, basically implying that, you know, you're against the law and the cops and people want to come after you and throw you in jail. <laughs> and it's like, really, do you really need to do this? It, it's, well, yeah, I, look, mean, I don't mind the fact that... they were responding to our queries. Uh, I mean, so just, they're, only, they're only telling the truth as they see it. Uh, just the whole tone, just, it sounds to me like scaring people to, to give them more money. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, this, is, this is my thing here. So I would gladly pay to stream the Olympics at my house at a decent quality. I don't know mm. what the super sports stream is like. I hear it's not that great. Yeah, we'll I hear it that they're streaming basically the mobile stream, the DVBH stream. Uh, I stand to be corrected. Um, but uh, uh, so this whole situation, by the way, it, it's come, it, it's blown up in, in quite a big way because um, the Olympics committee uh, mm -hmm. has YouTube streams um, that, and Gareth and I sit on opposite sides of the fence on this, on this debate. They have free YouTube streams in countries that don't have broadcasters with rights to the Olympics. With exclusive rights yeah. to the so Olympics. So MultiChoice has exclusive rights to the Olympics, not just over satellite, but also online. Um, and you only get access to it if you're a DSTV subscriber, and, and I believe only as a premium subscriber. I don't know of another way to get access to Supersport. Um, there might be like classic, uh, and then you get like one... And like uh, a handful of super sport channels? Yeah, maybe sure. one or two. There, there are quite a few uh, Olympic channels. Um, in, in, the, in the lower end, in the lower tier packages. Yeah. Um, Look, you can also, also obviously get with the Drifter and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. At a, at a much lower quality than... Yes. But I'm willing, what I'm saying is I'm willing to pay them 300, 400 bucks um, for this month just to be able to stream the Olympics. Um, so anyway, that said... Um, uh, a lot of the blame is being laid at multi-choice's feet, which I, I don't feel is entirely justified. Um, because, yes, they, they've got exclusive rights, but... But they've got exclusive rights because they bought it. So they followed yes. the systems that were put in place and... By the IOC. By the IOC. And technically, it's IOC. Yeah. And it's this double... 
the, the fault I the, the fault I do lay at multi choices feet is not letting me uh, not not a putting the infrastructure in place and b letting me buy a package that just lets me stream the Olympics. I don't but, want anything else. But my I just thing with this, though, is I want to say is with the internet and the ease a lot of these things are, are coming on, it's becoming, it's going to soon be impossible for them to do this. To say, well, you know, this region here may get it, but, but you guys won't. And it's been proven time and time and time again. If you restrict access, if it's free there and not free here. People are going to get it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go, no, but why aren't you buying here? You know, I've, I have this piece of paper that says you, you have to only get it from me. It's like, well, you know, I can work around it. Yes, yes. You know, give it to me at a reasonable price and then, then and generally then all of a sudden people do that. Yeah. Because so all of a sudden they don't have to set up a VPN or so as you go through some sort them. of dodgy streaming site. Setting up a VPN is fairly easy, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I must say, I, look, I haven't done this because I'm too busy to watch the, the streams, but it, it would not take, it would take you half an hour and you'd be up and running. Mm -hmm. well, by, by the way, this works great for Netflix. Uh, Netflix. While we're talking about piracy, <laughs> the, the, the Internet Archive is now using BitTorrent, yes. which we all know is a pirate technology. And, and so it's the only thing. It's and nothing so the, legitimate. And so the Internet Archive must be legal. Yes. Yes, obviously. Clearly. Um, and I must say this is great. And it's the fact that they're using this and they're going, we want to prove and show that this, there are legitimate uses for BitTorrent and it's a great technology for distribution of content. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You know, look, even what's it, World of Warcraft uses it. It, there are very good legitimate business reasons for using it. Blizzard uses it quite a lot, actually. They, they use, use it in for StarCraft as well, yeah. Um, basically, if you're downloading any content from Blizzard, it's over BitTorrent. Mm. Yeah. And it um, works brilliantly. That's why. It's a very, very good distribution mix. It, uses, it effectively becomes distributed distribution. And, and, and it's a great cloud storage mechanism, by the way, I should say. So if I have legitimate content mm -hmm. in my BitTorrent client and I format my PC, but I keep my BitTorrent data intact, I can literally just fire that up and say, okay, download my stuff again, please. As long as other people are seeding it. Yes. Yeah. But that's great. I mean, it basically means the internet's my backup server. Yes. So long as something is fairly popular. Um, and this is the thing, was with this popular, with the internet archive, because they do a lot of uh, Creative Commons stuff and free stuff that you're allowed to reuse and stuff. And they've got, I know, like a million books that they're releasing via this. Um, a whole bunch of movies and music and all the rest of it. If there's something popular, and I, I've tried to download it, it's quite slow off the servers. If it's popular now, it will come down incredibly fast. The small stuff they will obviously keep on seeding, come down at the old speed, but it now is a stupid to download. Mm, Just mm. great. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, so um, some other back to South African news, um, which is that uh, it came out today, actually, that uh, MTN had their financial results today, the 8th, Aug 8th of August, by the way, Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they said that they will hopefully turn on LTE before the end of the year. They said they're looking at Q4 2012 using reformed spectrum. Very cool. Yeah, very interesting. Um, you know, you've played with this a bit and... It's yeah, beautiful. It's, it's pretty good. It also explains why MTN's other data network has been suffering if they're refarming. Uh, and, and I speak purely based on personal well, the, experience. Didn't they say that their refarming spectrum used for voice? Well, perhaps, but my MTN data connection has been really, really shocking. Yeah, okay, but like mine's where, always been really shocking. Where it flits between Edge and HSPA. Mine's been, well, mine was fairly good. I, I, I wouldn't to put you, it down like to this. last year. Uh, anyway, so th the bottom line is is that the refarming spectrum, it looks like it's 1800 megahertz spectrum, uh, which is what uh, a lot of other countries are using for their LTE deployments, by the way. And, by the way, which is what ATA uses. ATA has 1800 megahertz spectrum. And so they haven't been as forthcoming as MTN about their LTE plans, but ATA have said that they're looking at launching LTE next year, 2013. So not this year, but next year. And... Um, uh, not really sp on specific on the hows of, of how they're going to do it uh, without Spectrum. But it looks like we're looking at, you know, at least two operators who are going to go LTE, um, whether ICASA uh, issues the Spectrum or not. Um, uh, and just uh, to, to, I mean, um, looks, it sounds like I'm blaming ICASA there. The DOC is firmly to blame for this because um, ICASA is waiting on a policy direction from the minister. Um, to before they can issue the spectrum, uh, and that's a whole discussion. Isn't for, yeah, that's a whole rant we, we for another day. We need to get day. Samantha Perry back on again. And uh, I can rant about it for days, but I'm not going to. Isn't this going to complicate things long term, though? If they start using 1800 
now. Eight, 1800 now. Okay, but then devices are going to be rolling out that are 18, using LTE 18 on, on 1800. Then when they start using it on other... On 2600. Or well, one does hope that eventually... What's it, 800? Unfortunately, as you see with GSM, devices eventually just have to support all the frequencies. Yeah. So you eventually just have to have quad band phones, sorry. Um, mm. And probably the same thing is just going to happen with LTE. So you're going to have to have the popular... LTE frequencies plus whatever they use in the U United States. I mean, there, their there's, spectrum there's this, is a mess. There's this famous case now where the iPad launched with 4G support, which they had to uh, yank off the label in Australia mm. and, and South Africa. Uh, yeah, well, they didn't have to. They weren't forced to. In Australia, they were forced to, okay. and in South Africa, they just followed suit um, because I think the ASA, uh, you know, in the two countries are, are very similar in the way they rule on these things, and. Um, and so the, the, the reason, by the way, in Australia actually had nothing to do with that formal definition of 4G, which is what our ASA would probably rule on. It had to do with the fact that it doesn't work on the frequencies used anywhere else in the world uh, because the, the, the US LTE deployments are, is a wonky frequency. Um, so at least in South Africa, we're looking at fairly popular bands. 1800, um, the, the, the band that's going to be, uh, that needs to be licensed is 2600 and 800, and those are fairly well used. Obviously, the 800 spectrum, and I say obviously, that sounds very uh, derogatory. I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but the 800 megahertz spectrum won't become available until we've finished our migration from yeah. analog to digital broadcasting. Um, Which was supposed to happen but, a few years ago. But yeah, even, <laughs> yeah, even though... Another big rant for yeah, another day. Even though, uh, the, by the way, just so we're on this, while even though the LTE deployments might happen this year or next year, iPads still won't work because it's not on the right frequency. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look, these things must, or, or eventually they must, they're just going to have to support all the bands to be, which is what you see happens. Mm -hmm. You know, initially it's, it's they only support one or two, and then as time will go by, they support all of them. So I don't know why they just don't do that from the beginning. Uh, say that again. Hang on. Maybe I'll be able to answer the question. All of the, the modems I see, they always go, okay, we only support this band. Yes, And yes. then afterwards, like, well, actually, you know, and this modem supports this band, this modem supports I, I think it's got band. to do with, uh, with, with, uh, with the cost of manufacturing. And yeah, yeah, uh, who's going to be buying Eventually, at the end of the day, them. they always all support all of them. Yes, yes. Um, but you have as to it wrap becomes, up to that. Yeah, as it becomes necessary. So if it's not necessary now. It's about so volumes. It's yes. always about volumes. So the Qualcomm chips, which is what basically everybody uses, I think, um, to, to do this kind of thing, um, it, like it only becomes cheaper at volume. Mm. So uh, the basically the early adopters have to, it's it's the same as in any technology field. The early adopters have to pay the R and D costs, and once they've amortized all their the problems, costs, yeah. uh, they can they can then uh, you know they can make it cheap. Cool. So just some details we got from uh, MTN CTO. Um, is that they've uh, got about 200 LTE sites live at the moment running on 10 megahertz of reformed 1800 megahertz spectrum. And uh, they're looking at speeds of 70 megabit per second and latency of under 15 milliseconds So uh, in their test. So all in all, it's, um, it's, it's, it, looks actually, yeah. it looks actually pretty good. And Whether I know or not you, it'll be able to hold up like that when you start putting people it's, onto it. It's very little spectrum. Yeah. It is very little spectrum. So they're going to have, I don't know. Well, the, the, the they are very efficient with, with, with the spectrum. With these things generally, if you can increase the speed, the amount of time someone spends downloading decreases. So you can theoretically actually support more people. All depending on what you're doing and what occurs when you have lots of people hitting the cell and noise the, from that. The backhaul is the problem. Yeah. You've got you've to handle the backhaul and obviously the cell has limitations on how many Simultaneous connection yeah. with can handle. Look, more spectrum is always good though. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's uh, that's uh, that. Warren's mission broken by Tech Central. Yeah, yeah. They uh, had an interview with Carl Pinner um, after the thing today. We got a little snubbed. Uh, I'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ran for another day. <laughs> I think we've had enough. But uh, we did. <laughs> but we did get some feedback from them afterwards. Today, uh, I see is the rant day because we've just seen the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, then, other news that came through today, um, and it, this was actually a, uh, based on a story that Business Day ran uh, on the third of August already, which mm. I think was last week, if memory serves, uh, or if math serves, um, which is that an ICASA counselor leaked information about the ICASA. Uh, complaints and Compliance Committee uh, to an industry body. The industry body is unnamed. Uh, however, the, the councillor is not unnamed. They have named William Stuckey as the leak. Um, and, and so Telcom issued a statement today 
um, uh, urging strong action against this and, in, and a full investigation. And um, they hope that ICASA will act decisively, or I don't remember their exact wording on this, um, to reestablish the trust relationship between regulator and regulatee. Um, and uh, and uh, Telcom is also sort of in. It, it looks like the statement was written by a lawyer because uh, there's a lot of the a lot of the use of the word alleged, and there's also um, veiled threats of uh, Telcom investigating the damage done to it um, by this alleged leak, and uh, uh, you know suggesting a sue for civil damages um, if there was financial damages to Telcom. Telcom suing people? <laughs> no, <laughs> suing a car. Yeah, oh, we shouldn't say. No, like taking a cast out of court is like par for the course yeah. for the industry. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I do want to add, well, sorry, Tim. Well, I was going to say it's just more sad because you can see since Stucky has been there, it cost seems to have gained slightly more teeth and more things are happening. Yes. So I don't want this to now stop it. So yes. I hope this doesn't end. Yeah. Uh, I understand, you know, if, if there were rules broken, that disciplinary action might yes. be necessary. Yeah. But it would be a sad day for South African telecoms to lose William Stuckey yeah. as an ICASA councillor. I, I just don't want the good work to get undone and to stop now. I want, I want it to keep on going. I want the progress we've ha we finally been seeing yeah, yeah. To, and, to occur. To put things in perspective, okay, how long, uh, and I'll tell you how long, we've been waiting since at least 2005, if memory serves, for local loop unbundling. Maybe even longer than that. I don't even remember. Um, and uh, promises made by the DOC to make it happen, blah, blah, blah. Finally, um, to, to all credit where it's due, Roy Padayachi takes the helm at the DOC, uh, the late Roy Padayachi, uh, mm. I should say, also a very sad day. Um, and he uh, pretty much tells Ikasa, you will meet the deadline of, I think, 2010, a local loop unbundling, or 2011. I, don't, I think it was November 2011. The local loop was supposed to yes. be unbundled. Yeah. Right? And, um, and so uh, the, the Ikasa... Just was just not in a position to do this, uh, like it was impossible because nothing had happened. <laughs> um, and so uh, they, but regardless, they met, and William Stuckey was part of the ICASA panel. And um, while they didn't achieve local loop unbundling, they managed to negotiate something with Telcom to um, drive down uh, to drive down IPC costs, which has resulted in a direct increase in bandwidth and, and a decrease in uncapped pricing in some cases um, to end users. Yes. And so like after years of nothing, all of a sudden, even though we didn't get what we were promised, we at least got price cuts. We've we got movement. Yes. That's what we want. And like somebody said in the RSC, the hope the movement doesn't stop, but also the hope that nothing un unethical was actually done. Yes. Um, and hopefully if it was, it was a error of some kind. Yeah. But we don't know. Look, we're just going to have to walk, go through the wash and we're going to have to see what actually yeah, happens. Yeah, and this is, this is where that full investigation has to happen. Um, William Stuckey wasn't commenting, which I fully understand, to Business Day. Um, and he shouldn't. Yeah, uh, yeah, I wouldn't. Go, go, uh, go speak to your lawyer, get your like, lawyers to... To give some free media training here. <laughs> just don't talk to us, dude. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, until the investigation's done. Um, so, yeah, I hope it all turns out, turns out okay in the end. Mm. All right, so cool. with that, kicker. our kicker. Um, Garrett. Yes, Garrett, Garrett suggested this. Um, I've clicked support on this. Um, Lego has like a Kickstarter for Lego projects on its website. Sort of, uh, except it, it doesn't have to be... You don't actually have to pledge money. You don't have to pledge money. You just have to click support um, and give your email address so you may or may not receive some spam. I but just that, use that, Facebook. That's okay. Uh, yeah, you can do that too. So what this is, is an Android bot made out of Lego. Um, so a bunch of lime blocks, uh, lime colored blocks, and a couple of parts, a uh, bunch of moving parts too. So like the ears can move and the arms can move and I think the head can swivel. No, the head, I think it swivel 100 degrees, he said. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure about the legs. I didn't see those. Um, some of the blocks are actually kind of tricky to get. So what, what the guy who built this uh, and who put the idea up on the Lego uh, website um, what he said was he was going to open open up the design anyway, um, but some of the blocks are difficult to get a hold of. So the, the whole point behind this is that if he gets enough votes, then they can possibly turn it into a pack. And also, and there are no it. Lego blocks that are the official Android green. Yes. So, so if it becomes an official the, pack, the, that the, would be the official uh, Android uh, green. I think they are, but they're very rare and very expensive. The official Android green blocks. 
the, the, that color, yes. Okay, interesting. And they said, hopefully, if they can get this made into a pack, it stops being rare and therefore expensive. So they mm. can get the price mm. down. Mm. Yeah. So um, at his calculations of 15 US cents uh, per block, it comes to about $30 for the kit. With um, it being bundled into a pack, he says you might be looking at a 25% saving. Um, I made a mistake in uh, because I didn't actually read the page before I said support. Um, so I, I bid very low on this. So if you guys go in there, just keep in mind it's about th um, it's between I think 20 and 30 dollars. Um, you know, realistically to make this thing. So um, when you say support, be sure to be willing to put that kind of amount in the block. They don't actually take money. It's just to give them an indication of how much you're willing to pay for yeah. the. And if no pack. one's willing to pay a lot, then it's not worth it. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. If no one's willing to pay at least a decent amount, and if they don't get enough support, then they go, well, boohoo. But anyway, go and support Lego Bug Droid. Yes. It, it's awesome. That is, that's a command. That's a geek order or something. Yes. <laughs> Do it now. Yes. And with it. <laughs> this should totally yeah. just make it onto 4chan because um, he needs about 10,000 supporters and he's only at about 3,000 now. Where but it's I only been a couple of days. Didn't I find this on Reddit? I'm sure I did. Yeah. 4chan, so, man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, with that. Put it on 4chan and then cross post it to Reddit. <laughs> it's already, it has to be on Reddit already. <laughs> anyway, with that uh, brings us to the end of our show. Uh, I'm Jan from Yellen, by the way. You can find me at JanVZA on Twitter. Also, write for my broadband. That's where I spend most of my online time. So if I don't tweet a lot, you know why. I'm also on Google Plus on occasion. Uh, Jan from Yellen, circle the ugly face. Uh, Tim. Uh, Where can at Tim find Hawk you? on Twitter. Why not? <laughs> um, Tim underscore Hawk. True. <laughs> True. It's been a long week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, um, most of the time, let's leave it at that. But most of the time, you're Let's Talk Geek. Yeah. It's let's the other things network, that it takes up too much time. So yeah. I'm not really on the into interwebs that much. Uh, slapping the mixing desk today is Gareth from Yellen. Where can that people find you? Me. Uh, they can find me at uh, about.me slash hockey ZA. Uh, that'll point you to pretty much everything, all the sites that I, I, I frequent. Uh, yeah. Sweet. Thank you. With that, we're ending the show on time. Can wow. you believe it? Cool. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Check out other shows. We've got list of possibility on Monday nights. Tell us how you like our new studio. We've moved into House for Hack, and we haven't made an announcement yet, but uh, we'll make a big deal out of it uh, probably next yes, time week. Goes by, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, glad to be here. Uh, thanks for watching. Cool.